Recently, I have been speaking to a lot of people about the theory of language and language learning. But today, I'm going to be speaking to somebody who is much more interested in the practice. Somebody who, at the age of 73, has learnt 20 different languages. The polyglot Steve Kaufman. In this interview, we talk about language learning and making mistakes and why you should learn English. This is an edited version of our interview. If you would like to hear the full version, you will find a link down in the description box where you will also find a link to Steve's website. I hope you enjoy this interview. Steve Kaufman, thanks very much for, for, yes. talk, for talking to me. No, I look forward to it. So, so maybe for people who, who don't know you, could you maybe um, right. just introduce yourself a little bit and, and talk about, um, you know, like who you are and what you do? So, I mean, I'm a 73-year-old uh, grandfather, and uh, for most of my life, I was in the lumber business. Uh, I was originally in the Canadian diplomatic service, and I got into the lumber business, <laughs> Uh, but in the, over the last, say, 10, 12 years, I've, got, uh, I've become very interested in the whole subject of language learning. And uh, so I have a website together with my son where people learn, uh, I don't know, 35 languages we have on the site. It's called link, L-I-N-G-Q dot com. Uh, I've also learned more languages <clears throat> after the age of 60 than I learned before the age of 60. So I'm now, you know, I was working on Arabic and Persian, which would be number 19 and nine, number 20. Not that I speak them all fluently, but quite a few of the ones that I've learned since the age of 60, certainly my Russian, I, I understand, you know, very well. And I communicate with mistakes, but uh, fairly comfortably. So I'm a language keener, let's say. Was, was learning languages part of your career in the diplomatic service? I imagine it was. I grew up in Montreal, which is theoret was theoretically bilingual, but wasn't bilingual. So uh, English-speaking Montreal was uh, English, and French-speaking Montreal was French. That has since changed. But I became interested in French, even though I didn't really learn it at school. And then I went off to France, where for three years I studied at university in France. So everything was in French, right? So that got me going. And then uh, with the diplomatic service, I was sent to Hong Kong, because in those days, the Cultural Revolution was going on in China. So I was sent to Hong Kong to learn Mandarin Chinese. Subsequently, I served in Japan. So I had quite a bit of exposure to language there. And then I just continued from that point, so to speak. So, so maybe you could say that your, your interest in languages um, is, is, I don't know, something you've had for most of your life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the thing about it is, once you discover uh, you know, that you can do something, then you're motivated to do more of it. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's sports or music or anything else. So I think a lot of people who are struggling with their first, second language, they don't really have this sense that they can become fluent in another language. And once you do one language, then you're confident now that you can do it again. And in fact, I think we can all learn five or six languages more. No limit, really. I wondered, like, what is your general opinion of the world of of language teaching? I think most of language think? teaching has it backwards. Okay. That uh, language teaching is based on instructing people in the language, mostly. So here's the language, and here are the sort of fundamental structures in the language, uh, you know, grammatical issues in the language, and the teacher will teach those, and then there will be exercises on those, and then the student is supposed to be able to reproduce those structures in the language correctly. And that's a very difficult thing to do. That's getting it backwards. Uh, my view is that we should expose the learner to a lot of the language uh, through listening and reading, through, you know, content that gradually gets more difficult, through a lot of rep repetitive listening and reading, so that the language kind of washes over the learner. The learner now has some experience with the language, so that if then the learner looks at some grammatical explanation or some grammar tables or whatever it might be, at least they have a chance of understanding what this refers to. Uh, that doesn't mean they're going to be able to reproduce it because reproducing stuff correctly is a matter of habit. For me, you know, when, when I look at the industry as well, 
Um, you know, I see a lot of, you know, there's a lot of products out there from, from massive companies, you know, I'm not going to name names, but, but that, um, that, that are making what I consider to be just completely false promises. Um, you know, like learn a language in five minutes a day, um, fluent in, in three months, you know, this kind of thing. I mean, what, 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 what is your, cause I mean, obviously you've learned a lot of languages. So, so, you know, how do you feel about that aspect of, of, of language learning? Well, you know, several thoughts. First of all, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, and, and I have lots of books. I buy lots of books on language learning, teach yourself colloquial, you know, uh, assimil, which is very popular among certain language learners. And they say things like, this book will take you to B2 in the language, or you will master such and such. Or they'll say, in this lesson, you will learn how to, you know, negotiate the train station. But that's not true at all. That's not true at all. It takes a long time because language learning is a matter of getting used to a different way of expressing things. You actually have to train the brain in these new habits, and that doesn't happen quickly. It happens over a fairly long period of time. But there is one other consideration, and that is, I think, one of the most important things in language instruction is to motivate the learner, because if the learner is motivated, they will go out and do all kinds of stuff themselves to learn. Obviously, if you, if you set people kind of false expectations, then, then when they're sort of three weeks in and they realize this is going to take a long time, maybe they, you know, they give up. Um, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, in fact, a lot of people are very frustrated language learners. They're frustrated because they don't progress as quickly as they would like. And in a way, we're always somewhat frustrated. We would like to do better. And I always tell people, you know, give yourself credit for what you've done. And so to the extent that the, the uh, you know, give people false expectations, I think it's a negative thing. So yeah, it gets them in the door, but when they discover, in fact, that they actually have to do it every day, at least an hour a day, that it's going to take a year and not three months, and even then they're going to be dissatisfied with all the things they don't understand and all the things they can't say and all the mistakes they make. So I, I think, in effect, it's, it's, it's a bad strategy, but if you're selling books, it's probably a good strategy. Yeah, of course. It's a matter of what you're interested in. Uh, yeah, of course. But the thing is, you know, the more languages you learn, the better you become at language learning. The brain, you're developing a capability in your brain. Just like if you have never played any sport and you pick up a new sport, you won't be very good at it. But if you play tennis and then you want to take up, uh, I don't know, soccer and then you want to take up something else, the more sports you play, the better your capability of, of, of learning uh, a, a new sport. And I think it's not a matter of a special talent. Uh, this often comes up, and I point out that in certain countries, many people speak several languages, say, in Scandinavia or in Holland or in Germany or in Singapore, or I, I gather in South Africa or many places, people naturally speak three or four languages. I don't believe those people have some kind of a language learning gene in their ethnic makeup. I don't believe that. So. Anyone can, with use, develop in their brain the capability of learning one, two, three, four, five, six languages. But they have to be interested and they have to put in the work and the time. I agree with you. I think that um, motivation is, is, motivation could be the, everything, right? Could be the most important thing. Absolutely. And I'm curious, like, what, what, apart from your sort of maybe natural interest in language, what, what do you think would be a good way for people to get motivated to learn a language? You know, what, what, what would be some advice that you might have? You know, for, first of all, we take the case of English, which is different than all the other languages because English is the most useful language in the world. You know, if you sit on an airplane beside someone from Brazil, Japan, Kazakhstan, whatever, the greatest likelihood is that the common language will be English. So therefore, a lot of people want to learn English, not because they're in love with English or American or Australian culture or anything. It's because they something they have to do. Their employer told them to do it. Uh, they feel they get better academic opportunities, better professional opportunities and so forth. That's English. So, however, a lot of people who study English because they aren't that intrinsically motivated, they don't do very well. They just kind of go through the motions. Um, 
With the other languages, you know, it's interesting. Uh, people are interested in Japanese because of anime. People are interested in Korean because of Korean drama. Some people are interested in German rock music. I, got, I have no idea what that is. But uh, so, so those are the people who learn. It's because they have a, a motivation. My interest typically is history. So I, I want to read about, or even I like 19th century literature. So Russian, I wanted to read, you know, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky. That makes me a bit of an outlier today, but those are my interests. So uh, yeah, there has to be that, or you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, you know, a family member, whatever, grandma, who still speaks the language of the old country, and you've got to learn it. So there could be any, any possible motivation, but the motivation is what drives it. And I would add, uh, what people should look at is, you know, there's an expression in French called l'appétit vient en mangeant. So that you, we acquire the appetite while eating. So at first you may not think you're very motivated, but once you get in and start doing it, and especially if people can have some success, because success feeds motivation. So that's another reason why traditional language instruction is so bad, because you're asking people to do something that's intrinsically very difficult to try to understand theoretically how a language works when you have no experience with the language. Our emphasis should be on comprehension, gaining experience with the language, hearing a lot of the language, and then slowly introducing some concepts about the language and people will say, oh yeah, right, I saw, yeah, I was wondering about that myself. And then if the student is curious about some aspect of the language, they're far more likely to, to, uh, to learn some of those details of grammar but we don't do that in typical language instruction it's made very difficult so we basically demotivate people and so there's never an opportunity for that appetite to to arise you know so because something you talked about before you talked about you know some of your languages you can communicate but you make mistakes and and i know that you know a majority of of people who are learning any language a huge barrier for them is they don't want to use it because they're afraid of making those mistakes. And and what would you say? What would you say to those people? Well, you know the uh, the paradox is that if they aren't willing to make mistakes, they will continue to make mistakes. In other words, in order to stop making mistakes, well, first of all, they have to say, "I will always make some mistakes." Like I have, pe I did business in Europe with Swedes. Okay, Swedes, Germans, they speak English quite well. Most of them, many of them, they all have their little Swedish English phrases, German English phrases, and they have the little accent. It doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter. In no way did it prevent us from having, you know, good conversations on everything from business to social, whatever we were talking about. So that the fact that you make some mistakes is not a problem. Perfection is not the goal. That's point number one. Point number two is you have to make mistakes and most of your mistakes, you're going to correct yourself because there's no way that you know, it's a bit like the mother and the child. People say, well, the mother corrects the child. That's absolutely nonsense. If the mother corrected the child, I mean, how much correction does the mother do? If that were the case, children of immigrants, say in Australia, would always speak like their parents, which they don't. They speak like their peers. And so people make correct themselves, but they can only do that if they're engaged with the language, if they're speaking. So if you're hanging back because you're afraid of making a mistake, you're going to continue making mistakes. Let's imagine that tomorrow you are going to start learning a new language. What, what, what's, right. your, what's your language learning process? Well, I did it now for Arabic and Persian. Okay. First thing I had to do was learn the writing system because I very much believe in reading. Reading is, if I just hear something, I have a lot of trouble trying to remember it. Like if I have an online tutor and, and I say, how do you say this? And they give it to me in Persian or Arabic. I can't remember it, but all of my online tutors, they give me a, a list of say 15 or 20 words and phrases, which they also record by the way. And I import this into link as a lesson and I study it and slowly, you know, I have a chance of remembering those words. But, so I learned the writing system because it's different. If I were learning, uh, you know, Finnish, I wouldn't have to learn the writing system because I have the writing system. But then typically what I do is I buy a starter book, teach yourself a colloquial, whatever it might be. And then I start into our mini stories at Link. The key is listening, because you can do it everywhere. You can do it while working out. You can do it while, you know, I can get in an hour a day, 45 minutes to an hour a day, every day listening. And listening triggers the rest, because now I listen to stuff I didn't really understand. 
So now I want to read it and see what, what was that? Like I, I kept on missing the same parts or maybe I didn't understand any of it. And then I go back in and I read it. Then the next day I'll be listening to it again and they're still missing the same parts. And then I go back in so that the listening is key. The listening is something that's so easy to do, then it triggers the rest of it. Okay. So, so what, what would you say to, to students who maybe, you know, maybe they learned English at high school, but they didn't really learn anything. And maybe, you know, they, they went and they bought like a, like a teach yourself book and they didn't, you know, nothing happened. And, you know, what, what would you say to the student who, who really wants to learn a language, you know, English, but, but they don't really know what, like what to do and they don't know what, what works and, you know. Well, I would say that, that uh, they've got to have a strategy that is sort of a two-pronged strategy. The sort of big picture strategy and then the nuts and bolts strategy. And they got to do both of them. The big picture is get into content that interests you, whatever it might be. If you're in business, look up business articles on the internet, pick your way through them, learn the words, listen to podcasts on business. Depends what the level is, of course, but if they're not at that level, they got to start at a somewhat lower level, but that's kind of just getting the language in you. Lots of listening and reading. The other aspect is then the nuts and bolts, because particularly if you, if you need the language for business, then you are concerned about, you know, your tenses and all the other finicky points of, you know, of, English usage. Um, well, well, th thank you so much for talking okay, to me. Okay, well, thank you. I enjoyed it. And good luck.